The Divine Names by St. Dionysus the Areopagite Chapter 1 Dionysus the Elder to Timothy the Fellow Elder What the goal of this discourse is and the tradition regarding the Divine Names And so, my friend, after the theological representations, I come now to an explication of the Divine Names as far as possible. Here too, let us hold on to that scriptural rule that when we say anything about God, we should set down the truth, not in the plausible words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the power granted by the Spirit to the scripture writers, power by which, in a manner surpassing speech and knowledge, we reach a union superior to anything available to us by way of our own abilities or activities in the realm of discourse or of intellect. This is why we must not dare to resort to words or conceptions concerning that hidden trinity, trinity, trinity which transcends being, apart from trinity, what the sacred trinity, trinity, scriptures trinity, have divinely revealed. Trinity, trinity, Since trinity, the unknowing of what is beyond being is something us, above and beyond speech, mind, or us, being itself, one should ascribe to it an understanding of science. Let us therefore look as far upward as the light of sacred scriptures will allow. In our reverent awe of what is divine, let us be drawn together for the divine splendor. For, since we trust the superlative wisdom and truth of Scripture, the things of God are revealed to each mind in proportion to its capacity. And the divine goodness is such that, out of concern for our salvation, it deals out the immeasurable and infinite and limited measures. Just as the senses can neither grasp nor perceive the things of the mind, just as representation and shape can not take in the symbols and the shapeless, just as corporeal form cannot lay hold of the intangible and incorporeal, by the same standard of truth, beings are surpassed by the infinity beyond being, intelligences by that oneness which is beyond intelligence. Indeed, the inscrutable one is out of the reach of every rational process. Nor can any words come up to the inexpressible good. This one, this source of all unity, this supra-existent being. Mind beyond mind, word beyond speech. It is gathered up by no discourse, by no intuition, by no name. It is, and it is as no other being is cause of all existence, and therefore its self-transcending existence. It alone could give an authoritative account of what it really is. Now, as I've already said, we must not dare to apply words or conceptions to this hidden transcending God. We can use only what scripture has disclosed. In the scriptures, the deity has benevolently taught us that understanding and direct contemplation of itself is inacceptable or inaccessible to beings, since it actually surpasses being. I am growing weak. Do not me. Let me start this over. Now, as I've already said, we must not dare to apply words or conceptions to this hidden transcendent God. We can use only what scripture has disclosed. In the scriptures, the de deity has benevolently taught us that understanding and direct contemplation of itself is inaccessible to beings, since it actually surpasses being. Many scripture writers will tell you that the divinity is not only invisible and incomprehensible, but also unsearchable and inscrutable since there is not a trace for anyone who would reach through into the hidden depths of this infinity. And yet, on the other hand, the good is not absolutely incommunicable to everything. By itself, it generously reveals a firm, transcendent being, granting enlightenment proportionate to each being, and thereby draws sacred minds upward to its permitted contemplation, to participation, and to the state of becoming like it. What happens to those that rightly and properly make this effort is this. 
they do not venture toward an impossibly daring sight of God, one beyond what is duly granted them. Nor do they go tumbling downward where their own natural inclinations would take them. No. Instead, they are raised firmly and unswervingly upward in the direction of the ray which enlightens them. With a love matching the illuminations granted them, they take flight reverently, wisely, in all holiness. We go where we are commanded by those divine ordinances which rule all the sacred ranks of the heavenly orders. With our minds made prudent and holy, we offer worship to that which lies hidden beyond thought and beyond being. With a wise silence, we do honor to the inexpressible. We are raised up to the enlightening beams of the sacred scriptures, and with these to illuminate us, with our beings shaped to song of praise, we behold the divine light in a manner befitting us, and our praise resounds for that generous source of all holy enlightenment, a source which has told us about itself in the holy words of scripture. We learn, for instance, that it is the cause of everything, that it is origin, being, and life. To those who fall away, it is the voice calling, come back, and it is the power which raises them up again. It refurbishes and restores the image of God corrupted within them. It is the sacred stability which is there for them when the tide of unholiness is tossing them about. It is safety for those who made a stand. It is the guide bringing upward those uplifted to it, and is the enlightenment of the illuminated. Source of perfection for those being made perfect, source of divinity for those being deified, principle of simplicity for those turning toward simplicity, point of unity for those made one, transcendently, beyond what is. It is the source of every source. Generously and as far as may be, it gives out a share of what is hidden. To sum up, it is the life of the living, the being of beings. It is the source and the cause of all life and of all being. For out of its goodness, it commands all things to be, and it keeps them going. learn of all these mysteries from the divine scriptures, and you will find that what the scripture writers have to say regarding the divine names refers, in revealing praises, to the beneficent processions of God. And so all these scriptural utterances celebrate the supreme deity by describing it as a monad or a hinad, because of its supernatural simplicity and indivisible unity, by which unifying power we are led to unity. We, in the diversity of what we are, are drawn together by it and are led into a godlike oneness, into a unity reflecting God. They also describe it as a trinity, for with a transcendent fecundity, it is manifested as three persons. This is why. All fatherhood in heaven and on earth is and is named after it. They call it cause of being since in its goodness it employed its creative powers to summon all things into being. And it is hailed as wise and beautiful because beings, which keep their nature uncorrupted, are filled with divine harmony and sacred beauty. But they especially call it loving toward humanity because in one of its persons, it accepted a true share of what it is we are, and thereby issued a call to man's lowly state to rise up to it. In a fashion beyond words, the simplicity of Jesus became something complex. The timeless took on the duration of the temporal, and with neither change nor confusion of what constitutes he came into our human nature. 
he who totally transcends the natural order of the world. This is the kind of divine enlightenment into which we have been initiated by the hidden tradition of our inspired teachers, a tradition at one with scripture. We now grasp these things in the best way we can, and as they come to us, wrapped in the sacred veils of that love toward humanity with which scripture and hierarchical traditions cover the truths of the mind with things derived from the realm of the senses. And so it is that the transcendent is clothed in the terms of being, with shape and form on things which have neither, and numerous symbols are employed to convey the various attributes of what is an imageless and supernatural simplicity. But in time to come, when we are incorruptible and immortal, when we have come at last to the blessed inheritance of being like Christ, then, as scripture says, we shall always be with the Lord. In most holy contemplation, we shall be ever filled with the sight of God shining gloriously around us, as once it shone for the disciples of the divine transfiguration. And there we shall be, our minds away from passion and from earth, and we shall have a conceptual gift of light from him, and, somehow, in a way we cannot know, we shall be united with him, and our understanding carried away, blessedly happy, we shall be struck by his blazing light. Marvelously, our minds will be like those in the heavens above. We shall be equal to the angels and sons of God, being sons of the resurrection. This is what the truth of the scripture affirms. But as for now, what happens is this. We use whatever appropriate symbols we can for the things of God. With these analogies, we are raised upward toward the truth of the mind's vision, a truth which is simple and one. We leave behind us all our notions of the divine. We call a halt to the activities of our mind and to the extent that is proper. We approach the ray which transcends being. Here, in a manner no words can describe, pre-existed all the goals of all knowledge, and it is of a kind that neither intelligence nor speech can lay hold of it, nor can it at all be contemplated since it surpasses everything and is wholly beyond our capacity to know it. Transcendently, it contains within itself the boundaries of every natural knowledge and energy. At the same time, it established by an unlimited power beyond all the celestial minds. And if all knowledge is of that which is and is limited to the realm of the existent, then whatever transcends being must also transcend knowledge. How then can we speak of the divine names? How can we do this if the transcendent surpasses all discourse and all knowledge? If it abides beyond the reach of mind and of being? If it encompasses and circumscribes, embraces and anticipates all things while itself eludes their grasp and escaping from any perception, imagination, opinion, name, discourse, apprehension, or understanding? How can we enter upon this undertaking if the Godhead is superior to being, and is unspeakable and unnameable. I said in my theological representations that one can neither discuss nor understand the one, the super unknowable, the transcendent, goodness itself, that is, the triadic unity, possessing the same divinity and the same goodness nor can one speak about and have knowledge of the fitting way in which the holy angels can commune with the comings or with the effects of the transcendently overwhelming goodness. Such things can neither be talked about nor grasped except by the angels who in some mysterious fashion have been deemed worthy. 
sense the union of divinized mind with the light beyond all divinity. Sense the union of divinized minds with the light beyond all deity occurs in the cessation of all intelligent activity. A godlike unified minds who imitate these angels as far as possible praise it most appropriately through the denial of all beings. Truly and supernaturally enlightened after this blessed union, they discover that although it is the cause of everything, it is not a thing since it transcends all things in a matter, in a mat, in a manner beyond being. Hence, with regard to the supra-essential being of God, transcendent goodness, transcendently there, no lover of truth, which is above all truth, will seek to praise it as word, or power, or mind, or life, or being. No. It is at a total remove from every condition, movement, life, imagination, conjecture, name, discourse, thought, conception, being, rest, dwelling, unity, limit, infinity, the totality of existence. And yet, since it is the underpinning of goodness, and by merely being there is the cause of everything, to praise this divinely beneficent providence, you must turn to all of creation. It is there at the center of everything, and everything has it for a destiny. It is there, before all things, and in it all things hold together. Because it is there, the world has come to be and exists. All things long for it. The intelligent and rational long for it by way of knowledge. The intelligent and rational long for it by way of knowledge. The lower strata by way of perception. The remainder by way of the stirrings of being alive and in whatever fashion befits their condition. Realizing all of this, the theologians praise it by every name, and as the nameless one. For they call it nameless when they speak of how the supreme deity, during a mysterious revelation of the symbolical appearance of God, rebuked the man who asked, What is your name? and led him away from any knowledge of the divine name by counter. Why do you ask my name, seeing it is wonderful? This surely is the wonderful name which is above every name, and is therefore without a name. It is surely the name established above every name that is named to either in this age or in that which is to come. And yet, on the other hand, they give it many names, such as I am being, life, light, God, the truth. These same wise writers, when praising the cause of everything that is, use names drawn from all the things caused. Good, beautiful, wise, beloved, God of gods, Lord of lords, holy of holies, eternal, existent, cause of the ages. They call him source of life, wisdom, mind, word, knower, possessor beforehand of all the treasures of knowledge, power, powerful, and king of kings, ancient of days, the unaging and unchanging, salvation, righteousness and sanctification, redemption, greatest of all, and yet the one and the still great. They say he is in our minds, in our souls, and in our bodies, in heaven and on earth, that while remaining ever within himself, he is also in and around and above the world, that he is above heaven and above all being, that he is sun, star, and fire, water, wind, and dew, cloud, the stone, and rock, that he 
is all. So it is that I, and so it is that as cause of all and as transcending all, he is rightly nameless and yet has the names of everything that is. Truly, he has dominion over all, and all things revolve around him, for he is their cause, their source, and their destiny. He is all in all, as scripture affirms. And certainly he is to be praised as being, for all things, the creator and originator, the one who brings them to completion, their preserver, their protector, and their home, the power which returns them to itself, and all this in the one single, irrepressible, and supreme act. For the unnamed goodness is not just the cause of cohesion, or life, or perfection, so that it is from this or that providential gesture that it earns a name, but it is actually, but it actually contains everything beforehand within itself. In this, in an uncomplicated and boundless manner, and it is thus by virtue of the unlimited goodness of its single all creative providence. Hence the songs of praise and the names for it are fittingly derived from the sum total of creation. These are not the only names for God favored by the scripture writers. These drawn from universal or individual acts of providence, or from those provided for. Some too have their origin in spiritual visions, which enlightened initiates or prophets in the holy places or elsewhere. Some too have their origin in spiritual visions, which enlightened initiates or prophets in the holy places or elsewhere. For all sorts of reasons, and because of all sorts of dynamic energies, they have applied to the divine goodness which surpasses every name and every splendor, descriptions of every sort, human, fiery, or amber shapes and forms. They praise its eyes, ears, hair, face, and hands, back, wings, and arms, a posterior, and feet. They have placed around it such things as crowns, chairs, cups, mixing bowls, similar mysterious items of which I will do my best to speak in symbolic theology, which I will do my best to speak in the symbolic theology. However, let us for the moment proceed to an explication. However, let us for the moment proceed to an explication of the conceptual names of God, collecting, for this purpose, what scripture has to say being guided in the manner I have already mentioned. And as hierarchical law leads us whenever we study the entire word of God, let us behold these acts of heavenly contemplation, which is indeed what they are, ready for a sight of God and our hearing made holy as we listen to the explication of the divine names. As the divine tradition so commands, let the holy be there only for the holy, and let such things be kept away from the mockery and the laughter of the uninitiated. Or rather, let us try to rescue such men and turn them from their hostility to God. So, my good Timothy, you must guard these things in accordance with the divine command, and you must never speak nor divulge divine things to the uninitiated. As for me, I pray that God should allow me to praise in a divine way the beneficent and divine names of the unutterable and unnameable deity, in that he take not, in that he take not the word of truth from out of my mouth. End of chapter one.